Here's an idea. Editing your children's genome could raise questions about whether or not they are authentic. In about the last decade, geneticists have developed the clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats or CRISPR system. It uses the repetitive structure of DNA as a guide for editing that DNA, allowing, with a suite of other techniques, for permanent and in some cases inheritable changes to the genome of organisms, including humans. And it's a big deal. It's such a big deal that JLo is producing a crime drama series about it. How exactly CRISPR works is beyond my expertise and the scope of this video, but luckily Vanessa from BrainCraft made a whole documentary about exactly that that's out next week. You can watch its trailer right now and you should watch it once you're done here. What we're gonna talk about now isn't how CRISPR works, but some of the conundrums which arise because of how well it works. In the short time this technology and technology like it has been around, first theorized 30 years ago, but really only developed in the last seven and still being perfected as we speak, it's gotten up to some pretty insane things like removing malaria from mosquitoes, creating more muscular beagles and drought resistant corn. There are plans to use it for cancer treatment and even as a cancer cure. The first trial for that was in China at the end of last year. And that trial, rose some eyebrows, as have a few others, because what we can do with CRISPR is quickly outpacing conversations about what we should do with CRISPR. Like, is it ready for human trials? And if it is, how do we track the consequences of direct human genome editing? What lines do we absolutely not cross? And though CRISPR has widespread applicability, the most discussed crossable lines have to do with humans, specifically human babies. So in this episode, we're gonna walk down a line of lines and discuss what crossing them might mean for humanity to see how we feel about technology developing faster than feels can be felt. So the blessing and the curse of CRISPR at all is that it's easy, cheap, and good. The people who can use it are far flung in parts of the world with differing ethical, moral, legal, medical, economic, and regulatory frameworks. This creates a tension between the global community of all humans with a shared genetic identity and local communities of some humans who, yeah, may be willing and financially able to risk it all to cure their cancer, but may also at some point be interested in changing someone's eye color, making them immune to certain diseases or simply more muscular or even increasing their intelligence. Think like limitless, except without the drugs and we are all Bradley Cooper. Oh, we should be so lucky. It may sound like science fiction, but right now this sort of thing is more in the realm of science. That's it, just science. Not just possible, but likely. Just a month before shooting this episode, the National Academy of Science and National Academy of Medicine teamed up to release Human Genome Editing, Science, Ethics, and Governance, a detailed study where they make recommendations for the responsible development and use of genome editing tech. They repeatedly stress that though the tech has wide elective applications for humans, it should be used only for the treatment or prevention of disease and disability and not other less pressing purposes. But I mean, come on, we've all seen Gattaca. It's worth asking who has the power to decide what purposes are and are not pressing. The worry is one ripped straight from the sci-fi hologram headlines. With widespread but gate-kept technology, the rich could pay for elective genetic enhancements unavailable to those without surplus cash. In time, two genetically divergent populations reify the divide between rich and poor on a genetic level, resulting in what Sidney Perkowitz at JSTOR Daily calls a soft eugenics. Not selective breeding for the good of the species, blech, but a literal genetic differentiation which emerges via differing access to medical technology. A related concern has to do with the lives of people with disabilities. If people are able to systematically edit genes responsible for a variety of disabilities, how does this impact the lives of those who don't or can't benefit from that technology? And furthermore, if there are fewer people with disabilities, overall, does it stand to reason that those remaining will have a harder time getting the respect or resources they deserve? That public programs benefiting the disabled will be unfairly curtailed because their impact has been quantitatively diminished? Much like the judgment about what is and is not a pressing purpose, we might also ask about what is and is not a disability. Who decides? And how does that impact the lives of people born with those conditions? 
One way to read the elimination of disabilities before birth is as a judgment on the assumed life of that person, and therefore of all people with that disability, that living with what has been deemed a hindrance, whether it's deafness, blindness, Down syndrome, or cystic fibrosis, all of which have their own very specific and impossible to compare challenges, is of a lesser quality than a life without. Any one parent electing that their child not be born with a genetic disorder may not be explicitly judging people with that disorder, only most likely thinking about their own child and responding to the unfortunate state of the world where, while the lives of people with disabilities are not fundamentally of a different value, they are often treated that way. How one does or does not purposefully or not make a political statement when considering this kind of genetic manipulation for their own child is a hugely complex conversation. But there may even be a more base concern when considering whether to edit your child's genome. Should you do it? Just period. Besides concerns about soft eugenics and disability, there is also conversation concerning whether parents possess the right to determine who their child will be via genetic manipulation. This is gonna take a little bit to unpack. Keep in mind, this child is still you. Simply the best of you. First, we should point out that the Committee on Human Gene Editing, again, recommends that before inheritable changes to the human genome are made, we set up a study to determine the long-term, like long-term, like whole generations long-term effects. The worry is if we change our children's eye color or resistance to certain diseases today, we may endanger the lives of their grandchildren due to unforeseen genetic ripple effects, which is not good for, uh, well, humanity. But for our purposes in this video, let's assume we have a safety guarantee for your kids, 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 kids. And let's also say that the technology is available to everyone. So we're simply talking about parents deciding various facets of their child's genetic makeup, decisions that'll be passed on to their children unless they are similarly edited, and so on and so on up the family tree. This is one facet of some arguments against CRISPR as unnatural or playing God, where aspects of a child's development were mysterious, left up to an inscrutable battle between nature and nurture. Science can now sweep some or all of the game pieces off the table and construct a custom genetic victory, thus resulting in the person most wanted by their parents. Tall like dad's side, smart like mom's side, with green eyes and red hair because hey, why not make them stand out in a crowd? Such a combo of characteristics may be extreme, though is theoretically possible. But mom and dad's decision to have a genius ginger bean pole isn't just one about genetics and abilities and appearance, but as a result of those things, also life experience. Going beyond the natural and God playing arguments, we can ask whether the direct influence on your kid's DNA is okay because of how involved it is, like helicopter parenting, but for genes. One way to view this question is as a problem of authenticity. From a certain perspective, one's genetic makeup and its lived results are generally thought to be the conclusion of a naturalistic kind of chance. So the deliberate configuration of a child conceivably results in children that aren't whoever they might have been naturally, but rather exactly who their parents wanted because they said so. Aspects of their existence arise not through a combination of gene selection, environmental effects, or nurture, but via box ticking. The person is therefore, as one particular argument might go, not authentically themselves. They are rather their parents' design. And design is shaped by trends, influenced heavily by the moment. Conversation about designer babies is often couched in ideas about the commodification of offspring. You can customize options on your car, your computer, your social media profile. Why not your kids? Because they're people, that's why. And I mean, to a certain degree, I agree. It is a little weird, but it's also complicated for a few reasons. First, it's sort of always been within the realm of possibility that one could manually, so to speak, determine the genetic makeup of one's children simply by choosing a partner with specific qualities or by living a certain lifestyle. One's genome also changes significantly throughout one's life, thanks to environmental effects. So the children I and a partner would create today is different from the one we'd make 10 years ago. Not to mention, before and during conception, carrier screenings or in vitro fertilization can identify and help navigate around aspects of a child's genetic makeup. While IVF was controversial at first, it isn't now thought to produce a person who isn't themselves, isn't 
authentic, which is itself a difficult concept. Most modern ideas stem from the Jean-Jacques Rousseauian perspective that authenticity is an internally derived ideal, that one finds some form of genuine self free from external influence by ignoring the desire for approval or dependence on others. Related to authenticity are also ideas about autonomy and truth, that to be authentic one must know who they are, act the way they know they are, and in doing so be true to themselves. But how does this work with genetics and not like which band t-shirts you wear? Can you be a genetic poser? An ancestor's purposeful mucking about with one's genes certainly sounds like a loss of autonomy to some degree. Maybe you were doomed to earnestly ask that question from I Heart Huckabees all along. How am I not myself? But also, arguably, designer DNA is no less purposeful than your parents choosing a mate or an environment or an age to have kids, just perhaps a little bit more direct. Maybe it's that authenticity is often related to some kind of search. To hear philosophers discuss it, authenticity is a process, not a state of being, but a balancing act between the self and external forces. Maybe in being designed, one need not search. You'd simply know, on paper, who you are. You don't gotta find yourself, you only gotta find your configuration documents and boom, there you are. There you are. But are you there? I mean, sure, if you're born with the genes and characteristics your parents choose from the mutant menu, as Vanessa calls it, in a way that's you. But to say this usurps your ability to become yourself seems to overemphasize the role of genetics in what philosopher David de Grazia calls one's narrative identity, the process of always becoming oneself through experience and self-reflection. Paradoxically, the ongoing process of being authentic is often thought to require a breadth of external experience such that one can test against their internal experience. A custom genome doesn't preclude internal experience, it just provides another way to understand it. Certainly one's appearance, ability, and health determines much of their authentic self, but to say those things determine it so completely that one is powerless to become themselves in the face of their parents design decisions seems hasty in the way the phrase the apple doesn't fall far from the tree always does. Maybe one branch of the tree hangs over a hill. Apple falls off the rolls down. The, you get what I'm saying. In the end, I don't think this question will be divorced from the others related to CRISPR. My gut says it won't be the technology itself, but how and by whom it's used that determines how those babies are considered. In one scenario, the first children born of CRISPR or a CRISPR-like process could, much like the first IVF or test tube babies, represent a kind of challenging novelty, but could also, much like IVF babies, quickly become yet another prenatal biomedical mainstay. This scenario is highly dependent, I think, upon the technology being used as recommended for disease prevention or treatment and with great care. But in another scenario, one that could determine whether certain groups will be seen or not seen as real or authentic, CRISPR is used only, or at first significantly, by a relatively small population who are lucky enough, for whatever reason, to have access, exasperating the effects of already vastly uneven access to medicine and medical technology. Bad enough would be only the rich benefit from genetic disease prevention or treatment. Worse, they may be in a position to choose, based on their own criteria, what besides disease is and is not a pressing purpose. And in this situation, maybe people won't have a reason to worry about if they're not authentic, but rather about if they are. What do y'all think? Would you edit your child's genome? In what situation would you? In what situation would you not? And how do you avoid the political and social ramifications of this kind of powerful technology? Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. And before we talk about what's in this week's comment response video, a little bit of news. YouTube has suggested that we stagger the release of our episodes and our comment responses. So we're gonna try that. We're gonna start to release comment response videos on Fridays. So we'll continue to tell you what will be in them at the end of the episodes, but then you will have to wait a day or two, depending upon when we release, to actually see them, because uh, apparently the algorithm likes it more. And you know what they say about algorithms. You, uh, you obey them. So, in this week's comment response video, which will be out on Friday, we talk about your thoughts regarding telekinesis as an allegory for the use of technology. Once that's uploaded, we'll put a link in the description or just keep an eye on your sub box. If you would like to support the show, Idea Channel has a Patreon. Thank you so, so much to all of our current patrons. If you haven't already, don't forget to check out the trailer for Vanessa's documentary Mutant Menu that's out the same day as this video, or if it's after May 10th, you can go and watch the documentary itself. It's here on YouTube. Uh, we'll put a link in the description once it's out. Uh, if you watch it, you might see some people that you recognize in it. I'm in it. <laughs>
We have a Facebook, an IRC, and a subreddit, and the tweets of the weeks are everyone, including Bracari Becca, who responded to Ben Zimmer's tweet about the history of the pronunciation of G-I-F with Team Jaif shoutouts. Jaif for life. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these muscular beagles.